in that time, Kenneth, he did not like Alicia. Walk it right there. Get back. Walk it. So I'm going to tell him it's so good. Go on, you want to get the crab like Alicia and clean him up like Alicia. Had a crab to hug himself. Throw him in a corset. Go on home like Alicia. We had your home. Because we don't have all kind of bush over the seafood for me now. Now, where you are going, you want to get him and tell him for? What is your heart? Oh, and tell me, say, I'm going $75 for offer. $75 for Oscar? And when I'm going to grind you on that, you're trifling. If Oscar did wreck you on that thing like a lady, instead of going to get you some old Jonah and, and get some, you going to pay for it? Well, um, eh, 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 what? And we know how for Oscar. Oh, great God, the children brought up the thing like that. How are they ever supposed to know how to do them? The thing did it, you ain't have to run them down the Austin, did it, ain't going to win. And like a bush. I'm fush, you ain't going to lay it, just can't have like an animal. I'm fush like some big people, the fush can be a little tricky sometimes. The honey can did it all day and not catch one. But don't use them all you be. I didn't know how to come in. Right on, just like that. He had nothing there but the hook. But now, all the children are hooked on the wrong thing. The hook wasn't going out of the rest of the list, but do just like I'm push. You'll wait for somebody else to come and feed you. Time in the week to hold up. Declan does. Sometimes, let's get it. Good afternoon. 
Yes, sir. Good afternoon. How can we help you? Well, you know, we've been traveling for a while. Yes. And uh, we started all the way up in North Carolina. Really? And we've been looking for the Gullah Geechee people. Why? Well, we heard about them that they're on the coast. They are. Well, so you're familiar with them? Yes. But we were looking for them all the way down where you start. Well, we were in Camp Fair and they scared the city of the Geechee, so you were in the right fearful place. And what did they tell you? They said, well, let's go to Charleston. Oh, yes. And what happened when they got to Charleston? The people at Charleston told us, come to Beaufort. And now you here in Beaufort County. And what can we do to help you? Can you tell us where the Gullah Geechee people are? But look here, you know what? All of your people, maybe you've been a cracky deacon, you've been a gully beacher, thing like that, and they have more cracky people too. Really? What? I said, right. All the people you spoke to were gully geechee. They didn't want to talk to you. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. So that clears it up because I could have sworn the person in Beaufort sounded like they were speaking. I said, gully, right? Yeah, but then they said, I'm not gully geechee. <laughs> no surprise. None at all. Really? Yeah, really. I see, you know, there's a statement. If you not at the table, you'll be on the menu. Yeah. I said, so what you come here to talk to people about? Well, you know, I work with one of these grants. Oh, Lord, you with one of them C grants? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? Because you ain't come here to grant the people nothing, so they done heard about you. What you want? Because the grants don't work for us over historical times. We have never been granted anything. If we didn't buy the work for it, we didn't get it. That's part of why they don't want to talk to you. Because it's a waste of time talking to y'all grant officials usually. But I'm just curious, what you want? Well, we were interested in finding out if y'all are still fishing. If y'all see all that oyster right there, that roaster. Oh, did we see it? We could smell it. That was part of the problem. We thought that's how you found us, because you smelled the food down the road and turning in. You know, so people wondering what you're doing coming in here. And then, you know, you see all the crab in this pot right here? And we starting to see that? You see that open there? You see that? You see that corn? They look good at it. Uh-huh, smell good right Get a bowl look. Yeah, now. <laughs> all that, we grew the okra and the tomatoes. We harvested from the land, and then we went on and harvested from the creek, the oyster and the crab and the shrimp. See that shrimp over there? See that other, see that other one over there? They about to fry the shrimp, too. And we got a little shark, too. So, so, so you need to tell me, y'all got all this when? Today? Really? Yes, sir. Where? See, right down that road, John? Out of the creek there. We've been to that same creek since the 15th, 1600s, and things like that. And we found the video on September. Then other as a church coming in about the 1700s, and things like that. And scrape through the night. We found the video. Use that same creek. You know, you see them casting that you see the net over there drying out, hanging up on that nail right there. All of us been doing this. And we teach the church how to do it. So that's why we about to just sit down to dinner. So, sir, we don't like to talk over our food. So if you don't mind, you found some Gullah Geechee, but, you know, you wasn't expected. So we need to kind of get back. We got company, as you see. Well, do uh, you think y'all might want to talk with us? About what? About y'all regulating something else? Well, you know, we don't do the regulations, ma'am. We said no, but y'all work with the DNNR, don't you? You work with the DNNR, don't you? Yeah, we work with the Department of Natural Resources, but we don't. We don't, we don't set the laws. It's the legislative members that set the law. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Leave me your card, and uh, I'll email you later. Oh, you will? Uh, yes, dear. We do have email and electricity and stuff as much as we still do this outdoor cooking and stuff. Believe it or not. And all the people that sent you this way, they have it too. That's why they know who you was, and they saw you coming. They know that logo on the side of that truck you were driving. And they ain't want to talk to you. Because they feel like it's a misnomer to call yourself a grant group and they don't ever get no money out of you. You understand? So they ain't want to spend their time. Because their time is just as valuable as yours. 
and they rather invest it where they're going to get a return and they get that out of passing on the tradition to the children the same way our ancestors passed it on to us. So, you know, we got to get back so we can, you know, form the food get cold, you know. But we, you, I hope y'all got some nice nabs or something to chop this so <laughs> y'all, are you mad? So, the story was shocked when I did email him so I could let him know a little bit about my coast and about what he might not have seen while he was busy riding up and down the road actually wanting to talk to people about the water. I don't understand why he came by car and not by boat because then he might have actually seen what we get to see it, you know, from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida and how that water is actually our bloodline and the land is our family and how when you just come talking to us about it, you don't realize how sacred the shore is to us. That this is a place that we honor our ancestors that came through the Middle Passage. That this is not a place for recreation. This is not a place for play. That right now the water is coming at us. We realize that we no longer have to go far to the shore. The water is coming to us. Where we used to go to the water where our family made it from one island to another. The children, we learned how to get out there and get the food from the elders. And we would row the bateau boats after we made them and get across there. Now we still trying to run the other rest of the children how to do that at the family gathering so they can know how for now fun thing and things like that. But that they can know the water to bring me, the water to take me back. You don't need no trawler to feed your whole family. You can go out there and get the little shrimp and oyster and have them to fry if you work with the Gullah Geechee Fishing Association who's fighting to make sure that our traditions remain on the shore, for sure, where everybody else is talking about commercial fishermen and recreational fishermen. What about the traditional Gullah Geechee folks? that sow the cast nets, that mitigate damage and harm to anything that's along the waterway. We go out in a bateau boat. We ain't going out trying to dirty fish and take the bottom of the ocean with us anywhere. We get just enough for the family for now, come for that evening. And the elders who can't go no more, we share it with them. And then here come the hurricanes that sometime again bring the land up on the water. And these folks want to blast here? And built for all, we done told them the only black goal you need on this coast is us. We have provided the richness all these generations. We fed not only our families with blue crabs, but we fed the others that come looking for the delicacy at the crab ball, the crab crack, looking for that devil crab, but there's too many devils getting in here on our shore now. So yet we stand praying that somehow that water that brought me will grind on back that we will not continue to level the trees along the shore, that the climate will change, where people will get understanding that traditional knowledge is worthwhile, but it is so valuable you need to invest in it. Don't just come and ask us who we be and where we are and how come you can't dig down for our roots, because if you dig down for our roots, you may be digging us up and you may be digging up our cultural community. We've learned this. We've dealt with this for hundreds of years. People come and say, well, where are you? Only to find out that the reason they were looking for us is to find where the prime real estate was, to try to remove us from that spot. Or to find out, oh, if that's good fishing ground, maybe that's where we need to gate it off. And maybe we'll put our clubhouse here. Or maybe that's another area where it looks so pretty because it's all purple right then. Not realizing those purple flowers are sweet grass in bloom. Meaning nobody had time to pull them to make the basket just yet. But if you took some time maybe, instead of just going on safari, instead of acting like Christopher Columbus lost along the shore, driving around just questioning folks, maybe if you took some time and just stopped and tarried for a little while and chat with folk, maybe they might share a little thing like that and stop setting you on a wild goose chase looking everywhere but where you needed to look for the people you were talking to or who you were looking for all the time. I know that's right. But where it is, is that because they hear us speak this way now. They say, oh, all the Gullah Geechees are gone. So they write grants without talking to us. 
and use the term Gullah Geechee in it and then get the funding to say, well, this is a culture that needs to be preserved. Preserves of what we put in a jar and put it on the shelf and then you leave it up there and it looked real pretty, but when it's time to eat it, you take off the top, you get it, you dump it out, the jar now is empty. Then I talk about continuation of culture that's different than preservation. So we preserve buildings, but you continue culture. And the way you continue culture is by living it. You don't allow other people to come in and strip you of it and tell you how they're going to teach you and your children about who you are because they could never be the experts on a cultural community that they haven't been a part of. Because there's always going to be those that send them further down the road somewhere else and tell them, we got a fire here with food on it, but it's a little chilly out so you might want to go get a fire going just to warm yourself up. Because it's a little cold when Gullah Geechee don't want to talk to you. I know it is. But guess why? They have good reason. Because folks haven't granted them the opportunity to respect that. Whether they speak this way or they throw them down like a dish and thing like that. They say they are the expert on who they be and thing like that. So what we've done is we formed the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank. And we published even our own book, We Be Gullah Geechee, about cultural collaborate capital and collaboration so that natives of the Gullah Geechee Nation worked with academicians, worked with others that are part of certain seed grants, that are educators, to put together collaborative reports about sustainability in the face of climate change and sea level rise and cultural degradation and lack of appreciation so that they would respect that we have protocols and guidelines for research in the Gullah Geechee Nation that we established ourselves. And that if you truly wanted to know who we be, I know where get it at from we. And not assume that because we speak multiple languages that yeah, we're gone. Because we write you. We the been and we ain't the guardian that we're talking to. So sometimes we leave from the tree and we have to go up there to these cold communities. And sometimes these folks from these cold climates, they come down here too. But I heard about these snowbirds being talked about a lot all day long. But some people don't count. But some people don't count the fact that everybody that comes to the coast is not a snowbird. Some of these people just try to get out of the cold atmosphere and come down to do research, especially in the summertime. They come down here from all over the country because now the world wants to know, well, wait a minute. It's something weird about the fact that these folks have been on that coast since the 15, 16, 1700s in different counties from the Carolinas down through Florida. But it's a hurricane zone. They say, why won't they leave? We have groups now talking about retreat. I saw the only retreat that we prefer, darling, is where there's a spa and the like. You understand? <laughs> That's the type of retreats we go to in the coast. But if you mean retreat as in leave in the English language, you might as well don't talk to us at all. So they said, well, what do y'all do? I said, we stay and we pray. And we survive. And our culture yet lies by staying away from y'all. <laughs> and they said, well, really? Well, we call this word resilience. Ah, that word doesn't exist in God. Resilience. So we had to check with these other R level people, the researchers, and talk about how they could support our resilience. So some folks up in Minnesota, you know, where I'm sure it's all nice and sunny today in Minnesota, huh? No, dark and cold. Dark and cold. <laughs> said, well, they weren't going to make this trip this time and come to North Carolina because they found out North Carolina was cold too. <laughs> but she decided she'd come another way. And fortunately, through technology, Dr. Kate Derrickson, who's part of our Gullah Geechee Sustainability Think Tank, decided that she would join us. So Kate, why don't you tell them the answer to this question that's on the board? How can researchers support Gullah Geechee resilience? Okay. 
Um, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to everybody today. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, I am the I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota, as Queen Quet said, and the co-director of the Create Initiative, uh, which is an acronym for co-developing research and engaged approaches to transform environments. And our goal with CREATE and the work that I've done on the sustainability think tank is to really think about, like at the most fundamental level, what are we doing here? What are we trying to do uh, as researchers, as academics based in uh, institutions of higher education? If our goal is to support Belagici self-determination, resilience, uh, surviving and thriving, what are the multifaceted ways that we can do that? And so, um, you know, I think historically or typically, we really think about it only in terms of knowledge products. So I'll do a bit of research and I'll deliver it to you, and you will then use it to be, become more resilient. And we're really trying to break apart a whole bunch of assumptions that are put in, in that typical exchange, um, and instead to think more, capaciously about what a research university in particular, what the research process in general, has to offer uh, this goal of surviving and thriving. Um, and so we've really used this idea of resourcefulness or resourcing through our collaborations, and we think about the university and all the resources that it has, and how we can bring those to bear to promote uh, resilience and self-determination. Um, we think about it in terms of material resources, so we think a lot about how the money that we spend, the, the money that we have access to, as well as the computing resources, the library infrastructure, all that kind of stuff that we have at the research university, how we can um, make that a resource for our community collaborators. And so um, Queen Quet and I have worked together to um, get funding and support to digitize the archives of the Bella Geechee Nation. For example, um, we're bringing Queen Quet to the University of Minnesota to teach two classes uh, next fall, although it's in her contract, she can leave when it starts snowing. Uh, but she is, uh, and so we think about it in those ways. How can we not just think about the knowledge products as resources, but also the, just the more general kind of infrastructure and material resources, and think about it as a more in a more genuinely collaborative way. Um, I am thrilled at the opportunity that our students are going to have to actually learn directly from Queen Quet instead of filtered through me. Um, and then we also think about resourcing the community as an ethical practice of scholarly research. So that means that at every turn when we think about what are we doing here, we think are we being a resource for communities. And if, if you've gone through graduate school or tried to get tenure, you know that that is a, a, an impulse that is not always well supported by the university itself. And so really just holding our, trying to hold ourselves accountable to make sure that what we're doing is actually about promoting Bella Geechee self-determination rather than leveraging relationships that we have to create products that will result in our own promotion if they don't have anything to do with uh, the shared goals of our community-based collaborators. And so we try to think about resourcefulness in those two ways. Um, we, when we think about the kinds of research that we're gonna do, we think about this approach we call triangulating the research question. So, you know, we have very frank conversations, Queen Quet and I, about like what do what do academics want to know? And we don't throw that question out the, the window, but we because we're at a research university and we have to make knowledge products that are you know recognizable to the institution as a as a the price of entry. But we always think about, you know, I always think about the million research questions that we could ask. Why do we ask these specific ones? And that's the part that we triangulate. So we think about what does the community want to know in particular? Um, and then we also ask what's at stake in knowing. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on that, but um, you know, I tend not to do research that will, I think, will create problems for my collaborators, let's say. Um, and then the last piece is about co-producing knowledge. So I think a lot about the epistemic authority of my collaborators and not reproducing, thinking about the value of expertise um, 
and you know the value of training and the value of the specific route that I've taken um, and my, my graduate students are taken and taking in terms of developing research approaches and methods and so forth. However, trying to ensure that we mobilize those things in a way that doesn't create a hierarchy where we think that this like university learning is better and more important and what is happening with Bellagici's is a local kind of knowledge that is uh, subsumed by this kind of expert knowledge, really trying to think about how epistemic authority works in our collaborations, because our broader goal is self-determination. So that, I mean, resilience is a word that, you know, is meaningful to a lot of folks who work in sustainability and climate change, and so we'll use that term if that is, is, a, is a way, to, is a bridge to conversation, but really what we're thinking about is self-determination. Um, and how can we be uh, collaborators with Bellagicis as they realize the environmental futures that they want to participate in? And so what kinds of research can we do to support that? And so, um, yeah, I think Queen's talked a little bit about the sustainability think tank, some questions that we've asked in the past. Um, we've talked about, we've done, and I've been involved in most of this, but not all of it. What are the impacts of gaming communities on Bellagici livelihoods? How do fishing regulations and regulatory enforcement impact Belagichi fishing practices? And then that's some work we've done in the past. And in the last little bit here, um, I'll talk about the last three questions that we've worked on. So um, scholars, uh, graduate students of the CREA initiative have worked with um, the representative of Belagichi for North Florida for Belagichi Nation on these last three questions. Um, Representative Glenda Simmons Jenkins, who is based in Nassau County, Florida, has raised these questions to us. She wanted to know how the history of Gullah Geechee's could be elevated in the context of North Florida. So there's a real strong understanding uh, and presence in South Carolina, maybe a little bit less so in North Carolina and Georgia. But in Florida, I think at times it's slightly less recognized. And so Representative Simmons Jenkins wanted to, act, to work with us to, to elevate the Gullah Geechee history in North Florida. She also wanted to ask us, ask us to look into what she was seeing, this increasing um, stormwater retention pond development that she was seeing. In fact, when it first started happening, they weren't sure what it was. Why are these like ponds of water showing up in our backyard? And asked us to do some work on that. And then um, she also asked us to do some work on the economic impacts of different land tenure scenarios. So, you know, uh, a lot of Bellagichis own their property in, as heirs' property, and that is a vulnerable way to own land in the context of the U.S. legal system. Well, the U.S. legal system and property laws make that a vulnerable way to hold land. And so Gullagichis are also own land in, in areas that are targeted for development. And so, um, you know, the, on the regular, they're trying to figure out, should I sell? Should I pay my taxes? What should I try? Do everything in my power to hold on to my land? And so forth. And so she wanted some information about how to think about different land tenure scenarios. And so the CREATE initiative um, has 15 CREATE scholars who are graduate students taken across the University of Minnesota from every single college and a range of different disciplines. Um, and they work with our community-based collaborators on these questions. And so um, one scholar, um, Emma DeVries, worked with uh, Representative Simmons Jenkins to ask some questions about the siting of stormwater retention ponds. And what you're looking at there is a Gullah Geechee um, family kind of compound or group of houses. Um, and you can see on uh, the left-hand side that it's like a really rural area. And you can imagine how a couple months later when that stormwater retention pond was finished and then full, full of water, it really changed the experience of living in that neighborhood. And I don't think I have, no, I don't have the slide, but um, if most of the land that you see there is owned by the corporation that, that, that is behind. So most of that land is land that was available to that corporation to build that retention pond, but they stuck it right back um, behind that neighborhood, that, that group of houses. And so she did a lot of different research showing how just for using aerial photos, 
um, these retention ponds were really having an impact on these rural communities and really changing what the landscape was like for people. Um, we also did some interviews with people about their experience living close to them and got them in touch with uh, people at the University of Minnesota who um, do research on stormwater retention ponds as a stormwater management strategy. Um, we also talked to the planners, the city planners, um, who confirmed, yeah, you know, like we haven't really thought about it that way, but now that you mention it to us, I do think these are disproportionately impacting Gullah Geechee communities um, because of the way, because of where Gullah Geechees live, because of the way development is happening. Um, and so just working with Representative Simmons Jenkins to pursue the question, find out what's going on there, give information um, that we can to help change the conversation. We're not, um, we're not diagnosing the problem, we're just using the resources of the research university, which is graduate student time, mapping capacity, um, expertise in things like stormwater retention ponds and their impacts in order to uh, um, provide information that might that, that, that our Gullah Geechee collaborators have asked for. Uh, this is another piece of research done by um, a graduate student uh, who is also part of the CREATE initiative. Um, and he is an econ uh, applied economist, and he looked into this question that Representative Simmons Jenkins had around different property, uh, different scenarios if you do different things with your property. And what he found was overwhelmingly, if you are able to hold on to your property, you will have more value. It will result in more value. And so this was helpful to Representative Simmons Jenkins because she works with a lot of people in her community who are really trying to make this decision. Should I sell and go, should I sell, get out and go rent a, a property somewhere else? What will that do to my bottom line over the long term? Or should I make the sacrifice if I can figure out a way to do it in order to hold on to my property? And what will that mean for me in the long term? And so, you know, from a create initiative perspective, our goal is self-determination and resourcing Golubichis, and we went and found as many graduate students, you know, the graduate students with the best skill sets that we could find to ask and answer these questions. And so we end up with a really wide-ranging set of research approaches and questions, um, but all united under this common rubric. And I think that's my last slide, and it's probably boring to listen you remotely from Minnesota, so I'll hand it back over. But I just want to say in closing that I think the main thing I want to take away is that as academics or researchers who think of ourselves in solidarity with communities, specifically Gullah Geechee's or other um, communities that are facing the consequences of environmental change, I think we have to really think carefully about um, the nature of our collaborations and what the work products and the knowledge products that we're producing are actually doing. Are they actually promoting self-determination? Are they actually um, promoting capacity uh, building, not just for resilience, but like I said, for self-determination? Or are they a case study for you know a bigger story we want to tell about resilience and really pushing back on the latter and you know, with CREATE trying to advocate for the former. Excellent. Thanks so much, Doc. Yeah. Yes, now it's interesting because the last part of what Dr. Derrickson said goes to why we thought somebody who was central to climate ought to be part of the Gullah Geechee Sustainability Center. So there is a place called Climate Central, you see. And so we figured they should be part of the work she's talking about because they already have the resources to look at what is happening around the country in regard to water, but in a different way. Not with a retention pond or anything, not with the regular tide that is high and low a couple of different times a day, but what's actually happening with sea level rise. So we found Dan Rizzo. And we found that he had a whole toolkit that we decided we want to dig in and play in just a little bit, all right? That started to show what would happen in the various areas, not only of the Gullah Geechee Nation, but along the whole eastern seaboard, if nothing's done. How many of y'all have ever gone to a planning meeting and they put up the different options on the screen and one is do nothing? Anybody other than me seen that, right? <laughs> 
So if we did nothing <laughs> at all to help anybody, resource anything to help be resilient at all, what would happen? Because the water's not doing nothing. As we mentioned, it's rising. And I know if y'all have been in other presentations today like I have, you've heard that over and over again. We've heard how the water levels used to be here someplace. They're here now. The shore used to be way over here, but now it's all the way here. <laughs> so you didn't buy waterfront property, but you got it now, huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so here it is that we thought Climate Central might be able to help us gauge this in such a manner that them we ain't cracking heat like a weird thing like that, they wouldn't understand what we'd account into the meat. So since they don't talk like us, we thought they'd help us give us some documentation and take to the other people who don't speak the way we do, but that speak in their language. So Dan, why don't you show them what you did? Thanks for being quick. It's always, it's always an honor to be here with you and Kwame and Dr. Erickson. Um, we, uh, we're an independent research nonprofit based in Princeton. We have a team of scientists that do peer reviewed research, and based on that research, we develop visuals to uh, communicate coastal flood risk and sea level rise to the general public. This was one of the flyover videos that we did back in late 2015, uh, and this is communicating how much sea level rise could eventually occur if we were to reach four degrees C or. Uh, Alternatively, if we can reduce our emissions and, and, and contain our uh, curb the warming to two degrees Celsius, uh, we also show how much uh, flooding would not occur. And so it was that contrast that we were aiming to communicate because those were, were the main goals that were being discussed. And so we've developed these flood technologies and uh, coastal flood tools and uh, uh, risk analysis tools to help coastal planners across the country and, and lesser extent around, around the world, um, uh, navigate this complex issue and to give them uh, information that can inform their decision-making uh, uh, planning. So uh, what I'll do now is I actually headed this, uh, actually let's see this works. Okay, so here's the slide up. We have three programs. Uh, our program is the program on sea level rise. And we have uh, we do journalism, so we partner with journalists across the country. Uh, and, uh, we also have a climate matters program that generates uh, <coughs> media ready content for meteorologists. The hundreds of meteorologists across the country are, are using our materials, but you can also access a lot of these materials on our website, climatecentral.org. Um, we're also non partisan, not advocacy. Um, this is a kind of word cloud of uh, when, when people download our 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 civil rise and coastal flood materials, we have the option of telling us who they are, where they're from, and how they intend to use our materials. So we took all of the uh, all the text from their entries and the, the larger words are the ones that are most frequent. So folks are using these were these were just the dot gov downloaders, so we've got dot org and no truck dot org, but Folks are using this to inform their planning, research, you know, presentations. Uh, there's a the mayor in South Florida who uses their stuff in his own presentations to his constituents. There are uh, state and federal agencies that use our materials for environmental assessments. And, uh, so just yesterday I took, uh, you can actually download layers from our, uh, our site, put them into Google Earth, and this is the same these are the same kind of four degrees, long, long term, four degrees Celsius, and two degrees, and 1.5 degrees Celsius layers in Google Earth. So we're looking at Williams, North Carolina, uh, uh, look, uh, eventually how much, and it is, this fire, anyway, I was thinking, yeah, I can just walk over here. <laughs> I think we're here. So this is not this is not the flooding that would occur. Uh, uh, it may not occur for the next uh, two hundred to thousand years, but we're locking it in this century. Uh, here it is. If we were to occur warming to one point five degrees Celsius, so there's a, there's a big contrast. So I did the same for Charleston, South Carolina. 
uh, long term civil rise lock in 4C, 1.5C. There's still some, but it's not mm. that bad. Uh, Buford, South Carolina, did I pronounce that right? Yes, you did. Okay. It's both in North Carolina and Buford, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I'm from New Jersey. Damn <laughs> but I spent a lot of time on the Gulf Coast uh, because I work on sea level rise. So, so Buford, South Carolina, after, after 4 degrees C, 1.5 degrees C. I should have converted that to, to with the temperatures that were used globally. We've got a lot of, um, I'll show you in a second. Savannah, Georgia, 4C, 2C. Um, Jekyll Island, 4C, 2C. Sometimes there's a big contrast between 2C and 1.5C. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, North Carolina. And so what we did is we, we um, this was the peer-reviewed research that we published in 2015, and we, um, in a way, we simplified the message further by uh, we worked with a photo photorealistic uh, artist, and we took iconic locations around the world and uh, generated uh, visual representations of what it looked like in different. Degrees C. This is New York. This is um, Wall Street in New York. Wow. Uh, it's so, <laughs> these images actually, we had a slider on our website and you can move them back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these images got, our website gets millions of views, but these got tens of millions of views globally. We, local media outlets picked it up. It was really interesting to see what got the most attention from the media. Um, this is for, I think, this Google's headquarters. So, we have, a, we have a number of these across the country. Uh, images across the world. This is this is new technology. I haven't shown it quite yet, but I floated on here. We're trying to create. Uh, we've talked with FEMA officials and other folks. It's it's a hard it's hard to communicate risk to the general public. What does it mean to be in a floodplain? Um, we're, we're in the process of developing technology that will use kind of Google Street View photography and capture lidar as well, elevation data to be able to show people's homes. Uh, flood levels, and so let's see if this works. This is just the, the beta version where we're showing the animation of waters rising to a certain level. Um, mm. Wow. Mm. We're still working on the visual part of it, but we're aiming to do a pilot soon, a, a town or two, and to aim the camera off to the side to show it. Lastly, I'll show you our, our Risk Finder web tool. You're all welcome to go to riskfinder.org and search for your location. Here in North Carolina, you can see all of the, uh, you can see all of the different area types. So if you're interested in a municipality or county or zip code, um, really this is a screening level tool. So we take NOAA's LIDAR data, elevation data, and uh, we intersect it with a lot of other federal data sets that we've collected. EPA, hazardous, hazardous waste sites, we have road miles, rail miles, hospitals, schools, we've got 100 different variables in there. And you can basically see what's at risk at different water levels. So it could be uh, five feet, you can move the water slide up to five feet, and it could be uh, an estimate of what could be the risk from a five foot next week, or long term sea level rise of a combination of the two. <coughs> so these are the different sections we have in each, we have a long page for each location, every zip code, every municipality is one of these pages. Summary section, sea level rise, plus flood is projections, uh, other modules uh, that I'll show you right now. Does anyone else know, notice that Google Chrome is slowed down? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the next topic. Still on. Okay. So. Do we have a, a suggestion for a county or municipality in North Carolina? I'm Carteret. Carteret. Yeah. Carteret. 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 
this. Um, so here we are in Carter Ave County. You can download a fact sheet, uh, a two-page um, PDF that you can bring to the community and together. We also have a more technical local report if you're uh, technical folks. Um, the first module is sea level rise projections. You can actually choose look at some of standard projections. You can choose different mod, mod, uh, scenarios. We have NOAA's in here. We're looking at NOAA's RCP 4.5 2017. But you can look at a faster rise. If you, look, if you, if you hover over the bar graphs to get the, the bars to get the height, we, we localize it and incorporate subsidence. Um, and what's interesting here is you can also look at cumulative multi-year flood risks. So how does under different sea level rise scenarios, how does that impact the risk of a four foot flood by 2030, 2040, 2050? Right? And so you can see how a slow rise versus a fast rise will, in a lot of cases, double the risk or triple the risk of increasing. So it's kind of taking this long term issue of sea level rise closer to the present and talking about how it's already impacting us. We also have the city planner sometimes use a single year risk, so not the risk one four foot flood by 2040, but the risk of a four foot flood in the year 2040. Uh, and you can see how uh, that really can vary based on which projections you're using. We also have a probabilistic model, so if you're very technical on the sea level rise side, you can click the gear icon and get in there and choose the different scenarios and percentiles and projections. But you can see how you can move the water slider on the left and look at the risk of different water levels. Then further down, we have Basically, what we use census data, so how many people are living on land basically, you know, from, from local high tide line up by the feet, currently living on land according to census, broken down by census type. Um, we have buildings, so uh, property value, government buildings, museums, uh, utility plants, state roads, power plants. And if you're interested in which power plant, you can download our Excel file, which will give you facility is named the latitude longitude coordinates. It's just public data that is presented in a different way. Um, contamination risks. So we work with EPA to uh, to incorporate their largest databases broken down by EPA and type or restricted categories and land areas. And so yeah, so we have and then you can break it down by zip code. Um, so you can see which so what are we interested in? Uh, people I'd like to look at population, but put it African American. It came sure. up automatically as Caucasian population. Oh, it's just oh, general population. That one, okay. And then, so oh, you have African American. Okay. Oh, right. Okay. So you, you choose your variable African American population. <coughs> and see which zip codes in the county have the most African Americans at risk of five feet, and you can move to ten feet, right? And see, you know, maybe the order on the right changes based on water level. Variable. You can also do it by town in that county. Um, mm -hmm. Or just type in North Carolina altogether and do the entire state and break it down by the county. What's another variable that someone's interested in for North, all of North Carolina? Place water sites or the uh, do you have like swine lagoons? Sorry. Swine lagoons? No, unfortunately we don't. Okay. We're open to adding new data. It's public and national. Uh, I'll choose um, hazardous waste sites. And let's go to um, six feet or something like that. So 59 at uh, risk of six feet. This is, we're using bathtub model for the uh, So there are the cities in we do congressional districts as well. <laughs> uh, congressional District 3 has the most hazardous waste sites in the place. Wow. Um, and what a Tom Tank um, has the most. And the rest is the second most. Um, yes? Can you break it down by um, at risk communities, low income communities, that type of thing? Or at-risk populations that can't 
weave? Yeah, well, the closest thing we have here is uh, we have social vulnerability, social vulnerability risk, so okay. it, which is high social vulnerability population. Okay. On the map, we also have that, that I've shown you yet. So if you scroll to the top and you click the full feature map, you go to our risk zone map, which is the comparable tool to this. It's a, and you can overlay social vulnerability, or we also have income level. How often would you be updating that in terms of? So that's a good question. How often we'll be updating it? Um, we're moving to a new platform actually, Google Earth Engine based platform, and we'll be generating a lot. We do a lot of the US maps over there, and we're hoping that we'll be able to update the data much faster using that technology. But I can't give you an exact estimate right now. It's on our mind though. So you can choose um, income level and ethnicity, population, and landmarks. This is all census data? Uh, a lot of it is, but we have um, we have a question mark that explains the sources for each state. Mm -hmm. Income is census data. I put in the tools so I don't remember it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you add data layers in the current platform or your future platform? Well, we're hoping in the future platform we can add that completely, but that's beyond it. Anything in the state of agriculture? We have land areas. Land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have land areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see the. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a report with Zillow. Sorry. There it is. So we have protected land, federal protected land, and state protected land, property value, but that's kind of the extent of it. So we have. There's. There's plenty of space to add more data sets. So feel free to reach out to me. Yeah. Do this if you want to demo. Or, yeah. Are there other areas, other locations you want me to cover? Or should we transition? Maybe we transition into that and yeah. ask another direct question. Because y'all see this tool, so it's still a work in progress, as Dan mentioned. So many of the questions you all have here, the same questions we've heard in other presentations, because people always have their specific interests that they want to add layers. So there'll probably be 150 different layers or tabs eventually, where Dan will get more gray hair than he's gotten since I saw him last year. Because he keeps telling them to add more and do more flyovers and do more of this stuff where it shows people visually you flood your city, right? Because I think the young people get more excited when they see a video like the one that showed how Washington, D.C. would look underwater, right? It looks more like a movie trailer. And so then you get them interested, and then we can start getting them to dig down in the weeds like we're trying to do, right? What population? What, what historic site is that? How much value is that in terms of the property? What would we lose? Well, wait a minute. We need to do something different, not take the no action approach, right? So I think all of these types of tools, and you saw how easy they made your life, where you can just click it and print out a PDF, isn't that great? You don't have to retype it or anything, and then you can print them right out and then walk into whoever's office you need to with this material, or incorporate it, just cite them uh, when you do your papers or other presentations. So I thank Dr. Derrickson, thank Dan Rizzo, and now it's on you. What other questions do you have for us before we close out, before they rise up to <coughs> us to come out of this room? Yes. I have a question for all the work you're doing. Um, can you speak a little bit about, um, I can see you're doing it at a high level, but locally are you, are you sending this message to the children that are part of the community, and you see the little girl from Sweden, mm -hmm. and we have a little girl in Charlotte, you know, the youth are speaking out, and Absolutely. I'm wondering in, in your community if their youth are engaging and speaking out. In terms of Gullah Geechee children, they tend to be more homebody children, okay? And just like I told someone the other day, my teachers used to push me to be the one to stand up there and speak for everybody in the school. Mm -hmm. Not that I chose to do it. Mm -hmm. They chose me to do it. And I see the same thing happening now. The unfortunate thing is we don't have teachers like what I had. So they're not pushing the students forward to necessarily speak out on these topics. They're barely reaching the students with getting them to realize they're Gullah Geechee. Now, fortunately, we have a new superintendent in the county that I'm from, Buford County, South Carolina. 
he just heard me speak for the first time a couple Saturdays ago. Mm -hmm. And he made sure to say to me, we have to talk because I want to make sure all <coughs> the students that are in this district learn about their culture. Because he grew up, he's Cuban, grew up in Miami, and he said and he never heard of Gullah Geechee culture essentially until he got the job up in the Gullah Geechee Nation and how unfortunate it is that he's reaching students and find out they don't even know their culture. So we got to get them there first before they can realize what the impacts of climate change are on the culture. You got to know you have something valuable that it can impact. Right. So we want to make sure when the messages go out, they go out correctly. So we have a lot of young people who we interface with, especially every March. March is Gullah Geechee Volunteer Month. So we have students that can range anywhere, usually from middle and high school to college, mostly college because they're on their spring breaks. So we do alternative spring break and community uh, engagement learning. So what they call transformational learning. So they do community service, but they're learning about culture, they're learning about the intersection between culture and environmental issues that we're dealing with, environmental justice, whether it's climate change, various things of this nature. Um, we're involved with the United Nations. That's why I'm headed next again um, to UN COP25. And so a lot of the information is passed down that way. And I'm a computer scientist. So I was the first one to develop Gullah Geechee TV and Gullah Geechee Rhythm Radio. So a lot of the elementary and middle schools use my videos in the classroom. I found that out because I used it for the celebration in Charleston go to a number of schools. And I walked in one, and it gets off. I was like, what's wrong with y'all? This is your queen quit. For real? How y'all think I had a queen quit? What make you think I queen quit? We thought it's your queen quit. I said, like, how do y'all know that? They said, we just watched you on TV. I said, what do you mean you just watched me on TV? They said, we just, no, they said, we just watched you. I said, I was on TV. They said, you was on right there. And I was like, what? And I turned around, and it was just a white screen but it was a smart board. So they said, hit the mouse. And I hit the mouse, and there I was. <laughs> the teacher had just been showing them one of the videos I did for the younger people. And so it's good to know that that work is not in vain, that the teachers are obtaining that information and now using it with the youth. So once again, I can't get to all of them that physically, but I can get to them that way. And so it is helping, and it is working out. Yeah. All right, come right here, now come right there. See? You with the smile. <laughs> oh, no. Great. Uh, you've got these wonderful tools for yeah. showing people what can happen to their community. Absolutely. Yes. So how are you using that to talk to the community? Oh, yes. Well, a lot of, how do we do it? How do we meld it, right? Well, what I do, just because I'm a computer scientist, I love this tool from day one, right? I was like, yes, I love the slider bar, and I can play with this, and I can adjust this. And then I threw questions at Dan that I didn't know was going to lead to me almost being an advisor to his team after that. So sometimes we do phone calls, and he'll say, well, you what do you think of this part of the tool? But what about this? And I'm like, you need a, there's a glitch there, right? Don't you need to do this? He's like, you caught that. We didn't notice that. So it's been fun. So. That scientific world I get to talk to, but then I get to just take the good, fun stuff to my community. So even if Dan's not there, I love those flyover videos. I, we've been trying to get them done for where we are, so now at least we got the pictures that he showed you today. That was a little treat for me that he put that in there. So I get to use that in my community and show them, hey, y'all think the tide high now on so-and-so road? Let me show you what can happen. What? <laughs> you know, so we get to use the slider and put in our zip code, and then people get to see the population things, and they'll have a lot of questions like, what? Well, wait a minute, it says there's an airport. I remember that was one of our questions. What do you mean there's an airport? There ain't no airport on St. Helena. I said, that's not on St. Helena. Let's find out where it is. And then we could dig down in it. So the community likes it because it's interactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And they love that finally something has us on it. Because the sea islands are not normally seen on anything. So at least, you know, we're still working on it. And, cool. it, and it's localized, so people can really yeah. talk, go to their zip code or talk about locations they care about. Right. Which helps. They bring I mean, them was involved with the project in the 70s before this was available. Yeah. And this is what we wanted. To show right. the impact of development. Yes, on, on a particular area. Exactly. Because people couldn't 
visualize what's on their own. Exactly, but you can here, huh? Right. It right. makes it easy. So, so then what's the next step in the conversation? So you show people, okay, your house is going to be this way. underwater. Right. The community doesn't want to know it. Does their home? Absolutely. Yeah. So right. how do you, what's the next step? What do you mean, what's the next step? What's My community is the community of faith, so there's no difference in our steps at any time for 400 years. It's just a matter of having more information to do things with. Our next step is always telling all the people moving in, you're foolish. <laughs> That's always the next step. It's like you're foolish. We need to stop electing people who are not foolish that think that everything's about money. Everything's not about money. You cannot eat this money and survive. That's not a sustainable diet. So what happens when the land is not agricultural land now? How about it's inundated with salt water? You can't grow food there. How about the fisheries are inundated with fresh water? You have no oysters. What do you do then? Because what you guys think is important are the tourists. They're not coming there. So now what? That's what we do with it. That's why I said he and to folks like Dr. Derrickson have helped us give us tools to speak the language of the Western world. Mm -hmm. Because there's no logic to us in the linear thinking of the Western world. Everything we do is circular. And if you're part of a circle, you realize that if you start with energy here, that energy <coughs> does what now? It comes back there. And usually this gain momentum when it gets back, so it's going to have a harder impact than when you put it out there. So if you put out positive, you get more of it. You put out negative and destruction, you get more of that too. So what we usually use these tools for is not amongst my people. We don't, we're not having a problem here. We never built into the shoreline. We never built into the marsh. We knew not to do it. Okay? So it's not us that's the issue. We don't derby fish. So we don't go to the ocean with the intention of digging out the whole bottom and bringing everything back in one day, all right? We get just enough to sustain yourself for the future generations We leave some for the next generation. That's our mindset. That's our ideology. That's our paradigm. We have to shift the paradigms of the others, not my own people. I don't need these tools for them. I need these tools for y'all. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it provides me something that I can bring into the other meetings like these that I'm invited to, these political meetings I'm invited to, to say, well, you don't have to believe the emotional native. That's what they call this, even though I have a computer science degree, studied engineering, and graduated with honors. Hello. The emotional native, you don't have to listen to them. But read this. <laughs> yeah, go look at this for yourself. I'm not making it up. You see? And that's why these partnerships are so important. Because some places where, let's say we're ladies, there are some arenas, they're just not going to listen because a lady came in. But now, we get one of the guys to go, hey man, yeah, I'm with ya. <laughs> All you did was tell him what to say. <laughs> okay? So it's the same thing. Sometimes that's what it takes. You just got to have the right partner and the right person to go in. It's just like any type of sport that we can name. Certain players are on the field at certain times or on the court at certain times because you need them to make this particular move. Okay, so that's our playbook we use in the Western world. <laughs> Part of it is. That has brought some people along who maybe didn't understand it because I'm the first elected head of state for the Gullah Geechee Nation in world history. So at first, even some government people thought it was like a figurehead thing. They thought, oh, it's just cute. They're having a celebration. They're going to have a queen. I'm not a dancehall queen. <laughs> I'm actually a queen and a head of state. And over time, they started getting it. Okay, now we get it. Now we're working with them. But more so than just having my people with me, it's having others now respect us enough, like the folks at the UN, to say we respect the Gullah Geechee Nation so much that your nation has to be here with other nations to talk about these issues. <coughs> we cannot leave you out. We can't leave it to the U.S. government to talk about your government. And so that, I think, has made all the difference. And Dan even told me a story about how he got to be here this week because you said you were going with Queen Quick. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, he said, he said, as soon as I said, I have two conferences with Queen Quick, his boss was like, go. 
<laughs> you know, so we're doing this here, and then we're going to end the week in Florida, mm -hmm. doing another conference to present there as well, um, and to present these tools and what we're doing to continue Gullah Beach culture. So we want to say, take it, take it to all hundred children that taught them not robbery for coming to me in this thing, you know, and yet it will be the crack we keep up. And definitely the books that we have here, the books are for sale. And if any of y'all were looking at it, I saw y'all trying to write it down. Um, we be Gullah Geechee, all right? Cultural collaboration, cultural capital and collaboration <coughs> anthology. So you, go to you, can, you can buy it on Amazon. You can go to gullahgeechee.biz, which would be the difference is then we get all the money if you get it through gullahgeechee.biz and it's autographed. Right? Or you can buy one here. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is the only one I have with me for sale today because I have been on tour and I'm sold out. They bought me out in Detroit. I was at the Federal Reserve last weekend, so I'm waiting for the next shipment to come in this week. But if you order it and want it shipped to you, we can do that as well. Um, and then the rest of the books that are here are all part of the history series that I've written. This is six of them to date that have been printed. I always let people know that God told me when I started putting out books that I was going to write 30 books. When I started doing history books, I was like, I'm doing 30 history books about Gullah Geechee. That's amazing. Why? And then it hit me recently. There are 15 books that I've done already. And not all of them are history. Some are novels. I have two novels coming out for the first time this December. Uh, and then God was like, right, I told you 30 books. You the ones that 30 history books. I said, oh, I got you. So I said, so I'm halfway there. Yes. All right. So I'm so happy I'm halfway there. Um, the release of the two novels will happen at the Barnes and Noble in West Ashley on December the 21st. So we're going to have a Gullah Geechee Holy Days celebration. So if any of y'all from the Chuck, uh, y'all want to come from North Skakalaki down to the Chuck, come have a good time. We're going to have, we just won't let us bring food in because we would have bought some of that good seafood out there. <laughs> They said, we can't have food in Barnes and Noble. Wonder why. No, I'm just playing. Uh, you know, they only let you have Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to have to talk Starbucks and go to get your days so we get a hook up. Uh, but we'll be there. So hopefully y'all can come and celebrate with us. And if you want to follow us, we're at Gullah Geechee on Twitter, at Gullah Geechee on Instagram. There's no I in Geechee for the week. And we are Gullah Geechee Nation on Facebook. GullahGeecheeNation.com will connect you to our blog. So you can watch videos and listen to the radio program and know about letter writing campaigns on environmental justice <laughs> issues we're dealing with, various things. So you'll know all about them as well as the celebrations, the parties, the festivals, where you can come on out and enjoy yourself. I know all y'all environmental people ready to get them suits and stuff <laughs> off today. Y'all go on field trips tomorrow? In the mud. In the mud tomorrow, y'all going in the pluck mud tomorrow, but y'all stay warm, definitely. And once again, please thank Dr. Derrickson for the comments.